On this episode of the High Note Podcast, we are joined by none other than Cynthia Stokes. She's an opera stage director who runs the program at University of Arizona in Tucson and is doing some incredible things there and all over the country with her incredible stage direction. Without any further ado, Cynthia Stokes. Welcome to the High Note Podcast. I am Ted Zanicki, owner of High Note Performance and HNPacademy.com, where we take the tools perfected by sports science and bring them to stage athletes to help turn singers into the kind of athletes and artists that companies want to hire again and again and again. Today, we are joined by the incredible, multi-talented Cynthia Stokes. I am so excited to welcome you, Cynthia. Thank you so much for taking some time. Oh, it's my pleasure, Ted. It, and it's so good to see you and hear about this fantastic podcast that you've got going. Thank you so much. So, so Cynthia, you and I met at, at this point many, many years ago when I was a student at the the Taos uh, summer, opera summer program, right? right. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, and for anyone who, who might not know, uh, Cynthia, what do you do? Well, I trained as a stage director. So my background uh, actually originally was in music. I was a singer and a pianist and a violinist, and I was really not good at any of those things. <laughs> well, and you know, this is interesting, Ted, that you talked about this this notion of athletics and artistry. That I think one of the the driving principles that I've always had was was coming to a realization really early that there were certain things that I was not going to be doing. I was not going to be on stage and I was not going to be performing, but that my talents lied somewhere else. And in fact, they were behind the scenes, really helping singers and helping actors prepare for the work that they were going to be doing on the stage, whether it's in college or in professional situations, young artist programs and et cetera. So, so that was sort of my journey towards, towards working with singers I think that's that's so interesting. There's so many of us who start off on sort of the performance track, right? right? And and how was it that you found that that track wasn't right for you? You know, I loved to rehearse and I hated to perform. <laughs> so <laughs> so I will uh, I would say that that was probably the key to all of it, you know. And when I I moved to New York when I was in my early twenties and. I just fell in love with the rehearsal process. I also fell in love with working with performers mm -hmm. and the fact that performers like athletes have these very extraordinary gifts that, that are so singular and so special. And, um, and so I really devoted my life to, to looking at how to help singers and, and performers in all kinds of different ways become their very best. That's awesome. And and so you are now, of course, uh, running the opera program at University of Arizona down in Tucson, right? right? Yeah. And so how I'm, I, I just got my uh, endowed chair. So this is very funny. I'm the Amelia T. Raymond endowed chair for opera theater, which is very funny. And, and after I got tenure, I was like, so guys, where's the chair? And they, <laughs> somebody, said, somebody goes, what have you got in your office right now? And I was like, oh, I've got this chair. They go, don't get rid of that. <laughs> 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 so my stupid joke about endowed chairs, but you expected an, an iron throne with Amelia engraved on it, and <laughs> something maybe something luxurious, Victorian red. <laughs> <laughs> and and so how how long have you been down at U of A now? U of A, um, 2017 was when I uh, started. I I came on as a guest artist in 2016. Um, Elizabeth Futrell, the fantastic singer, had reached out to me through Mary Jane Johnson from Taos and uh, said that they were looking for a guest artist. And I had been offered tenure track jobs over the years, and I just had no interest. I, I felt that academia was not conducive to the kinds of things that I was really interested in doing. But, you know, they tricked me. They brought me out. <laughs> I fell in love with the kids. I fell in love with Tucson. And I was like, oh. The next thing you know, we're <laughs> they, they you tricked know. you into running their program. <laughs> they tricked me, and and it has been a super super decision all along. I've I continue to really enjoy my colleagues. I really really feel like the students here are very special, and um and Tucson is a lovely. It's lovely. I mean, you're in Phoenix, so you know the the desert is the best place in the world to be. Yeah, you, I, I hadn't heard you say that before. You'd mentioned you had some real hesitation about going into academia before <laughs> you did. What, what caused that? Well, I think that uh, 
being focused on helping performers and helping artists is not always completely aligned with what we're trying to do in in an academic situation. And I think sometimes, and certainly this was the case when I was in school, was that the a lot of the focus was on the faculty and about what the faculty was brewing up and that there was a lot of drama and it was and it was not a healthy place. Um, conversely though, I really feel like U of A has continued to be a very nurturing environment for me, for my students, and and also I think for my colleagues that that are here with me at the University of Arizona. So um so that was that was I think that was part of my hesitation. And also we used to joke that I used to pay for my directing career by or no, I'm sorry, I used to pay for my teaching career through my directing work that, you know, directing operas is, is very lucrative. And uh, hmm. teaching is certainly in some situations is not always as lucrative. So, <laughs> and, and are you still doing some professional directing now outside of your U of A responsibilities? I, I am. I'm, I'm actually getting ready to go. The, this is another thing that U of A has been great about is that I'm getting ready to do a Figaro at Piedmont Opera in North Carolina. Um, and I leave, I think, a week from Sunday. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully in the fall, I'm going to be doing uh, a site-specific installation for Piedmont Opera as well in an abandoned church that's been de-sanctified. And we're going to be doing the opera of, of Joan of Arc. And um, I'm so excited about using that space to, to house that story. I think it's going to be very, very cool. Yeah, so I, I know that site-specific work is is one of your passions. It's something you've done quite a bit of. Um, I, I would love to hear more about how you came to that and, and what you feel like it really brings to the opera experience for an audience member or for sure. a performer. Yeah, well, you know, it. I think that a lot of what what my directing distills down to is this idea of building community. How do we, through works of art and that intersection of what a singer gives to an audience and what an audience responds back with is really such a sacred experience. And I think that building that idea of community from that grain of, of what's important led me to start to look at the intersection of architecture and performance mm -hmm. and how a space, if it's the right space, can can really make a piece of, of operatic work resonate in a way that nobody would have expected. And I think that part of what happens in that intersection is that um, people that might not consider going to the opera are excited because maybe they're maybe they're adventurous in a different way or they're curious. And I and I think it breaks down a lot of the preconceptions that people have about what operatic work is mm -hmm. and it um and it gives it a whole new meaning. So one example is the uh production I did here at U of A called La Hija de Rappuccini. It's uh, Rappuccini's daughter. It was Daniel Catan's opera and it's based on the Nathaniel Hawthorne short story. And we set it at a, a space on campus called ENR2, which is the Environmental and Natural Resources Building. And uh, La Hija de Rappuccini is about the environment. It's about genetics and it's about the ethics of genetics. And it's about locked off spaces and about access and about forbidden love. And, uh, and so the space, this beautiful hundred yard atrium that's six stories tall, housed for about 10 days this extraordinary performance and we uh and we really moved into the space and and it's a it's a working building so the people at ENR2 the faculty and students and staff were incredibly generous um and really welcomed us into the space and that we sort of became part of the the ENR2 family for, for the time that, that we were there and and we rigged the singer so that they could fly Wow. So there were times, I know it was so cool. So Six times, stories up. That's incredible. Yeah, it was amazing. And we had these gigantic costumes of these crazy flowers that were, you know, genetically modified. And so when the flowers would go up in the air, the costumes would become enormous. Mm. And it was, I mean, it still gives me chills. It was, <laughs> it was 
very, very cool. And we had a great time. We also did all these community events around it. We did events around the ethics of genetic cloning. And we did mm -hmm. um, a whole thing about, uh, you know, what's happening in the environment right now. So there were this whole series of other conversations that that filled that filled that space for that period of time. Wow. So it, was, so it seems like the the opera itself was kind of a, a culmination of so many other events. I, I don't know how the timing worked out, right? But there was so many events about things that pertained to the opera mm -hmm. before, after, during it that really made it a whole almost like a festival. That right? and the yeah. opera was just part of it. Yeah. I, in fact, I called it a, a festival of the mind. <laughs> wow. Because <laughs> I was like, we're not putting up tents, but it was a festival <laughs> of the mind, exactly. And we're doing something similar right now with um, Thumbprint. This is Kamala Chakram and uh, Susan Yankovic's piece about Mukhtar Mai, hmm. who sued the Pakistani government in 2005 and received a settlement. Uh, and she took the money and built a school for girls so that no one would have to sign their name with their thumbprint. Um, and we're wow. going to be doing kind of a festival of the mind around that as well. Conversations around literacy, conversations around um, colonialism and the history of Pakistan, um, looking at using opera as a tool for social justice. So that'll all be wrapped around that. Yeah, I think it. I think it's great. And I also think, too, getting back to my students, that it gives them an opportunity to start thinking of themselves as artists and not just uh, a tool for someone else, that they have their own artistic agency, they have their own artistic ideas, and that that their job as they move forward as practitioners and artists and whatever is to is to be entrepreneurial about mm. the way that they address their careers they're not just a cog in the in the music industry machine but they can mm. actually have some autonomy yeah ab absolutely absolutely and that um <coughs> pardon me i think it's really important that they see themselves that way and that they know that they have that kind of agency yeah, I, I, that, I, that's something I wish someone had given me when I was a, a much younger singer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, and for me too, I think as a as a young, as as a student too, or as a young person, like, you know, we're all telling you what what to think, but you know, what the heck do you think, and what are you gonna, and what are you gonna do with this, and. It, yeah, it took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> There's, it sounds like you're doing so much great stuff down there. If, if if I asked all the questions I had, we'd be here all day. Uh, but but there there's one word you mentioned. You said community a number of times. And I, I love that you're getting so much community involvement. I do think, however, that for so many companies and organizations, community has kind of turned into a buzzword, right? Mm. Where people say it for the sake of saying it. Yeah. Uh, I, I would love to know how you define community. Yeah. Well, I I don't think community. Oh, I, I don't think community is always place based. Um, I think community has to do with how we share certain experiences, and that it, it you know that we are part of one community for a period of time. On any given day, we are the community of students, and we are the community of faculty, and we are the community at U of A, and I'm the community of you know, whatever else. But I I think that this idea of, of what draws us together in some kind of meaningful way is is really the kind of community that that I'm interested in exploring. Um my community, you know, is adventurous and my community uh likes to take artistic risks and find new and wonderful things that are maybe a little bit out of people's comfort zones. Mm. And, and so I use that perspective or that notion pretty much in all the stuff that I'm programming at U of A. And I'm really lucky, Ted, I have, I'm also in a place where I can make extraordinary work with my students and I have, and I have a lot of space to do that and a lot of support. Um, you know, and then I go back and I and uh, and I direct for money, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm always happy to do as well. But it's it's a very interesting idea of 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 what community is and also what the needs are 
of different communities. This this Figaro is going to be a very different kind of Figaro than I would do if I was doing it with my students. It'll be hmm. it'll still be good, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I've, I, I've ever heard of a work of yours that wasn't. Uh, oh, very sweet. So speaking about you know site site specific works and and non location based communities, it, a work like Andre only seems natural. Yeah, yeah. Andre was so it was such just such a lucky thing. I um so, so, I so got before to, we get too deep into it, for anyone who <laughs> might not know, let, can, can you give just like a brief synopsis of of what the Andre expedition is? Yeah, sure. The Andre expedition was written by Dominic Argento, and it's based one of Argento's many superpowers was that he was a genius at taking found text and setting it to music. So he found these diaries written by three Swedish explorers who had attempted to circumnavigate the North Pole in a hydrogen balloon in 1897. Um, it's not a surprise. It did not go well. But uh, 30 years after these guys disappeared, they found their bodies and their diaries in Norway. Here's the crazy thing about this opera that makes it so cool is that it's not completely clear how each of them died. Mm. They had food, they had fuel, there were resources. And, and I think in different ways, each of them died from something different, whether it was a heartbreak, whether it was reeling, realizing that their hubris had destroyed them. Um, and then the horror of being the last man standing for a very, very long time. Mm. So I had done Andre Expedition uh, for my little, I had a little opera company in San Diego called uh, San Diego City Opera. And our whole thing was about doing installations in various places all over the city of San Diego. And we defined ourselves as sort of this speedy food truck that would, you know, zip in and do, you know, six performances somewhere and then leave the space. And it was, it was fun, but I became um, familiar with the piece then I did it with Michael Kjoldi in Vermont in an abandoned marble factory, which made perfect sense because the, there was this big space full of white rocks and it, it was just devastating. Yeah. And Michael played all three of the characters. Fast forward to the fall of 2017, I wrote a grant with one of my colleagues for a digital and performing arts lab. And we had this idea of like, you know, we'll we'll use VR cameras and we'll create VR, VR content and we'll intermix that with live work. And then the pandemic hit. And we were all kind of sitting around drinking a little too much <laughs> <laughs> and we and i just got this idea of, of what if i filmed the andre expedition in in virtual reality as opposed to doing it in a play like a play which really has a, a proscenium march so the idea with vr is that the audience is at the center of the work and that the piece happens around you and you just you can sit in a regular chair, you can sit in a turning chair, but that but that the piece happens to you that you are part in a way of the story. And so, so when we cool. it was so cool. So yeah. when we <laughs> um the the videographer whose name is Peter Torpe, uh, and I worked to just figure out kind of how we would set this. So instead of like on a regular stage where you have like, you know, stage left, stage right, we set it as a clock mm. with with the audience member sort of at the zero point of the hands of the clock. And, and Michael played all three of the characters. So he had three different costumes and we were able to just layer that over one another in, in the VR headset experience. So you could put the headset on and it starts off, you're in a snowstorm and you see this beautiful young man sitting on an ice pack playing a piano and you finally, the, clouds float away and there's michael as newt frankel sitting writing in his diary and he introduces us to the other characters and we go up in the hot air balloon and and then they end up on the ice pack and there's the second half of the story but but it was amazing to have a singer like michael kioldi do this um to have a a, a brilliant videographer like peter torpe work with me on this as well 
And we we filmed this in Tucson in August, just before the Omicron um, part of the part of the that virus. Surge, yeah. Right. And I remember being on the phone with them and I was like, what do you guys think? And there's a terrible line in, in Andre where he, he says, well, I guess we should try it. <laughs> and <laughs> I suppose, well, I guess we should try it. And so, so it's 104 degrees in Tucson. Michael's oh, wearing no. <laughs> huge costumes. We're like, we can't, no matter how cold you get in the room, it's a thousand degrees. And, right. and we filmed for four days, got everything in the can and then, fled for the next <laughs> of the pandemic but it was it was incredible and a great opportunity and, and, and a real testament to acting if he's if he could if it can be 104 outside and he's in you know winter coats and all that <laughs> right exactly exactly and um so we we did it we treated it sort of like a white paper to see if okay. if it worked and then we presented it at South by Southwest uh, in 2021. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry, 2022. We were at South by Southwest and got to do a presentation of it there. And then, uh, um, and then I did another presentation last year for the NOA conference, which was really fun. And so many of my colleagues had never put on a VR headset, so they were like, oh, "This is great." <laughs> I always say to people, like my mother, if she puts it on, she gets a little seasick. I'm like, "Take it off, take it off," but. Yeah. But for most people, they really enjoyed it. And it was a great experience to do that. But this goes back to community not being space-based, that it gives us an opportunity that one person anywhere in the world can have that extraordinary experience of, of being, you know, 12 feet away from Michael Chioldi, who sings like nobody's business. <laughs> it, so, yeah. So, it it is part of that notion of an adventurous community. That's it's so amazing the the way that you, that you're weaving all of this all of this together and blending you know opera which is one of the oldest forms of performing arts with virtual reality technology which is brand new and and bringing it to to people who otherwise would never be able to get to see it it's it's yeah. really amazing yeah, uh, that's how we roll <laughs> yeah <laughs> so what made you choose opera specifically i mean i, I know you have uh, an arts background from when you were very young but why opera why not theater why not movies why not music theater sure um well you know opera singers are just the most incredible humans on the face of the earth what what an opera singer can do is is sacred I, I use that word again, but the, I think that space that a singer occupies is the most extraordinary thing any human can do. And, and that it's such rarefied air for the people that, that are so good at it. And so, you know, I, I suppose I, I pray at the altar of the artist in, in whatever, whatever God I believe in on any given day. But, but I really do believe that that, that, notion of serving that work is is really important and also uh, again to this goes back to that notion of of how an audience responds to it how how transformative it is to have that connection between a performer and an audience um you know and i've done musical theater and i love theater as well but something about about the size of opera, about the size of voices, about the size of the stories, about how devastating it is, it's and how beautiful it is, you know. I and I think sometimes we forget when my um when my oldest son was about four, we were at a dress rehearsal of the magic flute. Mm -hmm. And there's the scene where Pamina is like, I'm gonna go kill myself, and I'm reading the super titles to him, right? And he bursts into tears. He's like, oh, Mom, she can't kill herself, she can't kill herself. And I I was like, oh, honey, it's, and I thought, it's real for him because it's the first time. And she was singing so beautifully. And I, it was this great reminder for me about how lucky we are to do the work we do on any given day, you know, to, to be able to make these stories and to collaborate with, with one another in, in whatever way we're working is, 
it's pretty good it's a great way to spend a day <laughs> it's pretty good yeah pretty good man yeah yeah oh man that's 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 so powerful thank you for 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 sharing that that's awesome that's true it's uh, really true thank you for asking of course of course so i i would love to know a little more about your your directing philosophies when it comes to undergraduate and graduate students because i i believe the program at, at u of a please correct me if i'm wrong is undergrad grad and and dma is it or is it ad as well yeah, it's dma yeah DMA. That we have. yeah so how do you address each of those different levels differently or is there a difference i think that you're always you have to meet people where they are and and also um you have to see for people sometimes what they can't see for themselves. So for, you know, and this is true when you're staging an opera, you know, that it all makes sense to me. And I have to just convince everybody to come along for a certain point. And then everyone goes, oh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that, yes, we meet everybody where they are, but here's the deal. We all love stories and we all love characters. And, and and so when you have a freshman who's you know singing Barbarina and re just helping them think about who am I and what do I want and what's the life or death reason that I have to communicate this and what happens if I don't I mean those really simple questions mm. are universal so you can you can help an eighteen year old you can help a thirty year old you can help a colleague who's you know got an established career just by remembering those those couple of things and all of it taps into the imagination that's that's the most powerful tool we have you know the the voice gets better when we use our imagination the alignment in our bodies gets better when we use our imagination everything starts to fall together when we when we start to believe isn't that that's such a that's such a cool human thing like it's the most humanness of of all the things that we do that that we that we love to pretend and in pretending we we make that true mm -hmm. so so that's true for anybody any we all have imagination and that's the that's the the kernel of all of it you know and different singers need different things and hopefully if i'm paying attention <laughs> to what to what they need i'm i'm able to help them with whatever it is that they're that they're going to do, um, you know, all of the work that we pick at U of A is really geared towards what is going to be a good experience for the kids. Obviously, I have my point of view about about work, but really, the the number one thing is what is going to serve my students. What's going to give them a great opportunity in a variety of languages and a variety of contexts and a variety of styles. So, so this season we did Dido and Aeneas and, and now Thumbprint. And I was like, Oh, it's a story of two heroines, you know, 400 yeah. years apart. But, but you know, that it was great for them to do a Baroque opera. And we set it in a very Baroque setting with, you know, big pieces of scenery behind them. And that was great for the kids to, to have that kind of pageantry, that kind of spectacle. And Thumbprint's very modern and it's video screens and things like that. So that's, that's, and it's, you know, done in this very, you know, Middle Eastern style of music, which is fantastic for them as well. So, so yeah, I think that's, that's always the goal. We're trying to serve, serve them and, and help them build their capacity in whatever it is that they're working towards doing. Yeah. So one of the things that, that I love about, everything that that you do is that you stay connected to singers at, at every level right so we talked about undergraduate and graduate and you're about to go off and do a, a professional production of, of uh, figaro uh what is it what are some of the things that you notice in maybe the higher level singers that the the younger singers just have a little difficulty grasping um oh this is oh that that's a such good questions. I think that uh, with my professional colleagues, and especially singers that I've had an opportunity to work with several times, they know that they come to the room as a collaborator with me, that 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 what we are doing is building something together. and and that's the capacity that I want my students to come to, that they that they come to a character with a point of view that can change, and the director may be like, oh, we're going to go this way. And then, you know, the the singer has to make some adjustments, but that, but that this really is a collaborative form. 
up to a point, um, and that we're working together to make to make these characters in this story as clear and delicious and juicy as we possibly can. So, so that's a, you know, th th and I'm watching this actually with a couple of my master students right now where they're like, oh, oh, oh. And, you know, we get into, actually we get into the run-throughs and I watched one of my students go, oh, and everything changed. Everything changed for him because he, he realized that, that he was, that it was his, you know, I can, I can nudge and cook and push. But the truth is he, he got to that point. He was like, this is mine. I know how to do this. And I was like, that's yours for the rest of your life, buddy. You know, they can't take that away from you. Yeah. <laughs> that's, so, thank you. that's a great question. Well, so based on, on your answer, I might know the answer to this next question. I think we all might, but I would love, I'm just want to make it, make it clear as day. Uh, when when you have a singer come in and work with you at at whatever level and they leave and they think back about the experience how would how would you like to be remembered by that singer another great question i have this metaphor i don't need, or this idea that you know for all of us that that work with singers we stand behind them and we put our hands on their backs and 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 sometimes you know a singer needs to lean back and and feel that support and sometimes they just need to go but the but the hands that memory that that muscle memory of those experiences are always with them and it's theirs forever and ever they need me let you know my idea really should be that they need me less and less as they go along mm -hmm. but that you know i'm always there even if even if I'm not sharing space, I have I have my hands on their back, and I'm I'm like I'm here. I'm a support, and I'm encouraging you to go forward and and do the work that you're supposed to do, and whatever that is, what whatever that turns itself into in the course of your life, and uh, and that's certainly how I feel about so many of my teachers that that they are you know they're with me uh, generally in a good way once in a while somebody will be like ah Cynthia you shouldn't have done that but but generally speaking I always feel that that they're there and that they hold me in a space of 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 safe that safe space to do dangerous things I love that line a safe space to do dangerous things yeah Man, or so dangerous artist I should say dangerous artistic things <laughs> Ooh, yeah. <laughs> of course uh, if someone needs to put that on a t-shirt, uh, <laughs> is, is there any framework that, that you've figured out for when to know when to help a singer lean back and when to help push them forward? Mm. Or is it totally by feel every time? You know, I, I, I bet you 20 years ago, I could have told you, I think now so much of it is just, it's listening. It's just, it's listening and responding. Um, and it's my intuition. I, I think that I, I've always been a constructivist teacher that, you know, that we, we build together and we grow together. And yeah. by doing things experientially, I know for myself, I learn better. Um, you know, and that there are no failures. I think that that's a big piece of it too, that to, to just own the fact that it's, it's all part of the suit. You know, sometimes you don't want to, the next time you make the suit, maybe you won't put so much of that in it, but it, but it's this long, long experience of process. And we have to, and we have to just listen and be aware and, and patient. Ugh. And especially with ourselves, don't you think it's oh, so hard patient with yourself my god i can be patient with the world my children my husband my pets my students and then i'm like whoosh, whoosh, god so the, you should have done that and it's like everyone it deserves a, love and grace except for me right for me. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so and that's when i and that's when i remember you know i have i have the people who helped me with their hands on my back so i don't know if there's a system i just i i've become a really good listener Mm. I, I think that's that's such a, a valuable skill, just being able to actually hear when someone is talking. Mm. I think that that only 
lends itself to the constructivist direction directive style that you've been talking about this whole time. Uh, so getting just a little bit more into, into the, the logistics of, of your program for someone who's you know listening, who might be thinking about auditioning, uh, mm -hmm. how, how big are, is, is each level of, of your program right now? Um, I think that we have 65 students uh, right now at U of A. We have three voice area faculty, me and uh, one one part time coach. We're hoping that that builds into a, a bigger a bigger footprint soon. Um, we also have two full productions that we do every year, so soup to nuts, as well as two sets of opera scenes. Mm. Um, two we all wow. yeah we do two sets of opera or one set of opera scenes in the fall and one in the spring and that's particularly for kids that didn't maybe get cast kids that are really interested in maybe working on something new and also for the young the youngest of the of the members of of the of the university um uh, u of a one of the things that i think is really great about ua is that it's it's an r1 and that means that there's everything is really based around research. Like mm. how are we researching this notion of X, Y, or Z that, that the opera projects really are a laboratory of exploration, which is fun. That's a great way to think about it. Right. Yeah. Um, Talk about no failing. If you're do just doing an experiment, it's just research and you learn from every, every opportunity and every mistake that you make. So it's, that's fantastic. One of the things that we talk about all the time here is, is the, we call it the ADR protocol, but assess, drill, reassess. It's just the scientific method. It's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I have an idea. I'm going to pursue it. Oh, didn't work out. Okay. I learned that. Now I can just go back and figure out the next thing. Exactly. Exactly. And that there is no failure in that exploration. That's, do that's you, a great. Do you find that, that. Do you find that that the students that come, do they have a, an easy time latching onto that? Do they love it, or or does it freak them out a little bit? I think it's really hard to to come to that idea because because I I really do think, and my own children are this generation of kids, so I really saw that in the way that my kids came up that that everything was like, well, what's the right answer, and. <laughs> it's more like, well, let's pretend there, you know, there there are certain things that always have to be right here, you know, but in terms of here and in terms of your heart, there's there's more space to to explore and to figure things out. So this notion that there is not a right answer, but that the right answer is, did you make this exercise worth your time? Mm. Then we're then we're into that. So I, I think it's hard. I also think that right now it's it's hard for kids. So many of these kids had the terrible experience of being locked down for a couple of years with, with the COVID pandemic, and and I think coming out of that continues to be a, a really anxiousness producing experience. So, so yeah, I think it's it's a little hard. I I always find I remember in ET when the little kid had to convince et to come out and he put the uh what was it the reese's peanut butter cup yeah 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 like i'm like look there's reese's peanut butter cup. <laughs> <laughs> <It's a> <laughs> treat <laughs> you can make what feels like a small mistake and be okay <laughs> you can still get the reese's treat <laughs> so yeah i think i think it's antithetical to to so much of the way that we look at education and um so yeah it's it's about convincing them that it's all right to to think about about your life and your space in a different way. Yeah, how do you put a rubric on an opera performance? Yeah, well, and and yet you could, you know, it it might be a process rubric or it could be a, you know, it could be a rubric like this or a rubric like that. Yeah, you could you could do it. I mean, but you, don't, it, you don't seem thrilled about the idea though. <laughs> But you know what, then I would be most interested in like having somebody do their self rubric, mm -hmm. right? Like, okay, where were, where were my successes? Where are my challenges? Where, you know, but, but you're working again too, to build capacity, to build that, that really higher level thinking for yourself. Can I, can I maybe turn, turn that question back towards you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure. 
just because with with your current program and and with everything else that that you're doing or let's look at, at since 2017 since you joined uh u of a what what do you feel like are some of your biggest successes where what are your, some of your challenges and what are some of the things coming up in maybe the next five years that you're really excited for oh, um i feel like i i really have cracked how to 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 develop process and uh and then i feel like i'm getting really good at turning process into product um i feel like the singers that that i work with who come through this program are developing a resilience they're curious they're risk takers and that to me is like christmas um as the program grows I want to uh, I want to build more collaborative projects for my students. Um, I'm really looking. I'm actually doing a little prototype right now of a composer, conductor, stage director, designer collaboration on a new piece. These are all students at U of A. Oh wow! And I know it's so cool. And one of my DMA students wrote a, a new opera, and so we've created this little prototype for a collaboration. And they are, I gave them a little bit of money for my budget, and they're going to be producing a piece in at the end of March. So if it goes the way I think it will, it could be the prototype for more collaborations. And and I think that it becomes like a little microcosm of what what we're all doing in the in the field, which is we're doing new work, we're creating new opportunities, we're doing collaborations, and that for my money is is going to be the next the next big thing and and how fantastic is it for a young opera singer to have a piece that's written with them in mind a, yeah. a piece that's for their voice i think that that's that's exciting and maybe even have the composer in the room to ask for small changes like all the time yep exactly yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, so we're awesome. yeah, well we're negotiating that because it's like all right how much time does the composer get to be in the room because you know <laughs> Yeah. It, it makes composers nervous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've only done that once myself, but where, where where the composer was in the room while I was singing, and I think everyone was nervous in that situation. Of course, of course, yeah. you, want, you want it to be great, and they are like, "Oh, well, they hate my work," and it's like, <laughs> "No, everybody, it's good, it's good." <laughs> we're all we're all trying to make everybody happy at the same time. Yeah. Really true. So let's talk about something that that people feel folks seem to be very polarized on um especially people in your position i would love to talk about auditions sure uh your initial thoughts when you have those audition days come around at u of a do you love them do you hate them or are they somewhere in between i think we need to do a better job of making an audition experience for our students feel more like what it's going to be like to be at u of a when when my students leave U of A and they're going off to graduate programs or they're going off to young artist programs, I'm always like, find the place that speaks to you. Find the find the place where you go. This is where I belong. One of my students just um, started at Peabody, and she had multiple offers at some very very good schools. And I was like, but what feels like it's the right place for you? And she said Peabody. And I was like, so that's where you got to go. And of course, we have to figure out how to pay for all that. But sure. you know, she's. But you know, she knew, and I think because she knew, then the universe just made this possible for her to be there. So, I, I barely because we're in the thick of auditions right now. I think that one of the things that we should all be doing is um, doing two things. One is I, I feel like we, we and me in particular, should be doing more one on one time with the students who are coming in to audition to get a sense of who they are and also for them to get a sense of who we are they should have a day with um co future colleagues to to go around and sit in on classes we're already doing lessons which i think is great but i i think that we could extend that even further we do something called a wildcat competition which is for high school kids and they come in for a day and they do a basically like a master class with us and then 
they take a little break and then we do a, a recital with them and mm-hmm. the winners from some other competitions. And I think it's just so great for the for the young kids who are in high school to get an opportunity to be on the same stage with students that are much, you know, further and much further along. Um, so, so those are some of the things I've been thinking about and how we make this audition process feel more like what it's going to be like to be here. Cause I, I don't know that, I don't know how kids get a sense, you know, aside from a lesson, how do you really get a sense that I can invest four or two or three years of my life and, you know, and my treasure, all this money yeah. to, 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 to commit to being in a place. I think you have, I think all of us have to have a better idea of of making community damn it all goes back to community. it all comes back to that to that community that, yeah that that this yeah. is community and it's a great place to be and that the that the students are all really good colleagues and are very generous with each other here which is not the case everywhere yeah yeah so what are some of the things that that a singer could do in an audition like in the however long it is if it's three minutes if it's 10 minutes if it's two 16 bar cuts like what yeah. are some of the things that you would love to see an audition that would make you remember someone in, in, a, in a positive way of course yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um who am i what do i want who am i singing to what's the life and death reason that i have to sing these words why do i have to make repeated text to make sense because even if it's repeated it's a different choice every single time mm-hmm. and that it's okay to move. You know, you don't want to necessarily do cartwheels, but, but it helps to just watch you moving on stage, especially if you feel relaxed. And if you don't need to move and you can be absolutely still and do your Kathleen battle and just park and sing like that, then do that. But I feel so many times that, that kids are just so locked up, you know, we want them to do good. We desperately want them to do their very very best every single time and and those strategies those those prompts i always think help a singer think more about communicating and less about this yeah i remember the the first time someone told me that that the the pe- the judges the audition panel that's in the room wants the singers to succeed every time that blew me away it completely blew my mind i it, it had never occurred to me that the uh, the judges in the room want to have an amazing experience and want to just have a free concert that day yeah and to watch you do your best because it you makes know? their job easier too they can just say yes <laughs> We're like, yes, come along. Yes, come along. Yes, come along. Exactly, exactly. So help, I, I think that reframing it for yourself as a as a performer. And then, you know, we used to play this game in New York called get 30 no's in 30 days. It was a it was it was a terrible exercise, but it was great that you had to go to 30 auditions or 30 interviews and that you had to get somebody to say no to you. Like the, in a funny way, the yeses didn't count. You know? <laughs> <laughs> 30, 30 rejections. Sure. And you come to this realization that it has, first off, you just get really good at auditioning, but also you realize they weren't buying what I was selling today. I, I did a good job with that audition and, and I can go home and go to the next thing in my day and not tear myself up about it. Yeah. And I think, just connecting back to something you said earlier about how it's difficult for this current crop of students to to sort of experience that level of, of failure or what feels to them like failure, right? Uh, rejection can be similar, right? So just getting, having that volume of auditions where you just get told no and realize, oh, I can get told no and be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so freeing. It totally is. It's such a valuable skill. Right. And I think it really is a skill. You have to learn how to accept a no and move on and be okay. And so then on to the next thing, right? Especially a no without feedback. I'm still working on that one. But <laughs> <laughs> like what? <laughs> yeah, what happened? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Well, Cynthia, we are running close on on time here. I, I want to be respectful of you. I, like I mentioned, I, I would love to hang out with you for 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 the rest of the day, uh, and just chat. But thank you so so much for for spending a little bit of time. Uh, I do just have a, a quick little lightning round, just to, to. So this is all personality coming from you. Uh, so I'm going to give you two options. Most of these, I'm going to give you two options. You just got to pick your favorite. You don't get to ask me clarifying questions and you don't get to justify. Got it. Let's okay. do it. Here we go. All right. There's not that many. So, but we'll, so we'll try to go quick. Uh, so cats or dogs? Cats. Mountains or beaches? Mountains. Guilty pleasure? Chocolate. Chocolate. Who's the last person you texted? My son. Your son. Are you a morning person or a night person? I'm a night person. Night person. This is an important one. What's your Hogwarts house? Oh, I'm a Gryffindor. Gryffindor. I, somehow I figured that. Uh, <laughs> would you rather have invisibility or super strength? Invisibility. Invisibility. And then the last one, I've had people like ace it until now, and then they, like, they get lost on this one. Snickers or Reese's? Snickers. All right. All right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> no, it's not what I would have chosen, but you know, there's no wrong answers here. There's no, <laughs> this is a safe place to do dangerous artistic things. Uh, <laughs> uh, Cynthia, again, thank you so, so much for your time. Uh, you know, the, the program that, that you're running at U of A really sounds amazing. I, I knew some folks who were there before you got there, um, and, and they had some mixed reviews sometimes, but everything I've heard about it since you joined in 2017 has just been truly phenomenal. So I, I, again, I've said this 15 times, but thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for coming on and talking about your program, about the amazing things that you're doing. Uh, for anyone who's listening, if they want to learn more or get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, email me at Cynthia Stokes at Arizona.edu. That's the easiest way to do it. Okay, fantastic. Cynthia, uh, is there any any final word that, that you would like to give? Oh, I know. Um, I was in Japan with uh, with my kids this spring, and this is what we this is what they do in Japan now. So it's hearts. So like here's a heart, here's a heart, and then there's a big heart. So I'm sending you lots of hearts and love. <laughs> Same to you, Cynthia. Same to you. Thank you so, so much again. Uh, and I, I'm sure I will talk to you again very, very soon. I can't wait. Thank you. Be well. If you liked what you just saw, make sure that you're on the High Note Performance mailing list so you can get first dibs to everything that we put out. Also, all the social media stuff, like, comment, share, subscribe, follow us on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and now Spotify and Apple Podcasts. All of that stuff helps more than you know, and it only takes just a second. And just for the few people who have stayed right to the very, very end of this, I am including some secret links in the description down below that gets you access to Hall of Fame singing and Hall of Fame practice. These are the two guides that all of our clients get so that they can take the first couple of steps. I've never given these away for free before, but I've decided to just for a short time. So if you click those links and it doesn't work anymore, I'm sorry you've missed your chance. So for now, jump in there as fast as you can and get your copy.